So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and oops, sorry. Um, welcome to our webinar on servitization for uh, a green transition. Um, today, we will share with you practitioner perspective on circular economy. Um, this is our second international webinar that is being organized in the framework of the European funded efficiency as a service project. Um, the Efficiency as a Service project aims to develop and deploy the servitization model to enable the transition and accelerate the market adoption of energy efficient solution in a B2B context. Uh, this project is being implemented in the Netherlands, uh, in Spain and in Belgium. And uh, BASE, Agoria, ANESE and EIT Inno Energy are the consortium partner for this project. Um, if you would like to learn more about the project and its deliverable, I'd like to invite you to visit the project website. Uh, you will have the link uh, to the project website at the end, the, the last slide of this presentation. Um, and then you can discover uh, the toolbox that we've uh, developed in support of efficiency as a service practitioners. Um, and also um, on the news page of the uh, efficiency as a service project website, you can also discover all the previous sessions that we've organized uh, in the contents of this project, but also the upcoming activities that, uh, that we have. Um, my name is Mirataya. I'm a circular economy expert at Agoria. Agoria is the Belgium Trade Federation of Technology Companies. And I'm joined by Dimitris Karamitsos. Dimitris is Senior Energy Efficiency Business Developer at BASE, uh, the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy, and Arno Neyrolder, uh, who is Business Analyst at uh, the European Institute of Technology, Inno Energy. Um, Dimitris, Arnaud and myself will be your host and moderators for today's uh, webinar. So what are the topics uh, for the day? Uh, we will, uh, the, today's webinar will be centered around the concept and topic of circular economy. Um, we know that circular economy is increasingly being recognized as a cornerstone to the Europe uh, green transition and competitive package. As we will see later today, circular economy is an essential building block uh, to the EU Green Deal. Um, circularity is also one of the 17 key performance indicators that the EU has set to measure its competitiveness. Um, yet, what we see today is that um, circular, circularity principles remain, uh, the implementation of circularity principle remain uh, quite slow. Um, and according to the latest circularity gap report, um, our world economy is currently only about 7.2% circular. So circular economy remains a concept that is still complex to apprehend and implement. Um, and then with today's webinar, we hope to shed some light on uh, this topic. Um, our speakers today will share with you some of the fundamentals about circular economy. Um, what lies behind such a concept and why is it an important pillar of the EU green transition? We will look into what the European Commission is doing to accelerate such a transition and how circular economy is being embedded um, in EU policy. And finally, we will hear from circular economy front runners who will share with you how and why they are incorporating circular economy within their company strategy. And we will end the webinar with a panel discussion uh, on circular economy trends, opportunities, um, and challenges. So it's more than time to uh, address a very warm welcome to our speakers for today. Uh, I'm happy to be joined by Manuel Braun. Uh, Manuel is the director at Systemic. Systemic is a global think tank focused on sustainability and circular economy. Within Systemic, uh, Manuel is responsible for the circular business model work, partnering with pioneering organization, investors, and entrepreneurs. Before joining Systemic, uh, Manuel has worked for a number of years at McKinsey, where he led sustainable product development and design projects across industries. Our second speaker is uh, Alberto Gonzalez Salas, who is energy and resources uh, partner at Deloitte. 
Alberto has a history of working in the management consulting industry and financial audits and focused, amongst other, on energy regulation, business transformation and energy business plan development. From the industry, I'm happy to welcome uh, Jonas Hildebrandt, Business Development Director at Danfoss, and Dominique Planck, CEO of Etap Lighting. Danfoss is a market leader within cooling and heating solutions. Danfoss Climate Solution delivers sustainable and energy efficient solution for industry, the built environment, and the entire food chain. Before joining Danfoss, Jonas spent uh, a number of years at the Boston Consulting Group as project leader. Our final speaker, Dominic, Plant, has more, Dom, Dominic Plank, sorry, has more than 30 years of experience in the lighting industry and has been appointed CEO of ETAP Lighting uh, since uh, November 2019. ETAP Lighting stands for more than 70 years of energy efficient uh, and innovative lighting solution in the professional environment. So welcome to all of uh, our four speakers. Um, before we start, a few uh, practicalities. So this webinar is being recorded, so we will share with you the presentation as well as the recording after the webinar. Um, we will have two Q&A sessions, so a Q&A session after the first two presentations, so from uh, Manuel and uh, from Alberto, and then we will have a, a second Q&A session after our speakers uh, from industry. Um, please do write your questions in the Q&A. Uh, function you can see the bottom at the, uh, the the button at the bottom of your screen um, so you can use this and write your question as they pop up um, all of your microphones have been muted however it's if at some point at the end you would like to, to raise a question uh, vocally you can um, still um, raise your hand so without further ado I now give the floor to Manuel uh, director at systemic Manuel, uh, the floor is yours. Um, first of all, hello. Hi from my side, Maro. Um, I would like to share my screen. Yes. No, but I think you have to. Okay. No, it should work. And and get started. Um, perfect. This, okay, perfect. Super. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, Mira, Dimitris, and the whole base team, and everybody here for dialing in and, and uh, your interest in that session. Uh, I'm Manuel, I'm director at Systemic, and I'm here in Germany, uh, building the German office um, of Systemic. Um, and uh, I do a lot of, lot of work on, on circular, uh, circular economy, basically working on that uh, with the perspective of thought leadership. So a lot of studies, often philanthropically funded, but also working with the companies want to play a leading role uh, there. Um, yes, and I mean, servitization, today it's about servitization, um, is essentially a radical business model innovation, right? And this business model focuses on selling services or outcomes that the product offer instead of the product itself. And for a company, this does not mean selling as many products as possible and, and optimizing for the, for the cost. Um, but it focuses a company on the performance of the products and the utility that a product provides and essentially more on the customer value. And uh, with that shift, uh, suddenly um, as a producer, you have a lot of benefit if your product is designed for quality, for lifetime, um, for repairability. Um, if you suddenly get cost advantages if, if your product is easy to, easy to repair and to maintain. Um, so with this business model, um, um there is a lot of power in it. a lot of power to combine an ecological uh, environmental benefit with an economic uh, benefit if it is designed right and this is what i would like to explore with you in the next uh, roughly 15 minutes and um to kick us off i would like to use uh, two perspectives on 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 um on that what we titled here is everything as a service we titled xaas um, so it's essentially the servitization uh, lens. The first perspective I want to take with you is the perspective of the circular economy. And I don't want to talk too much about climate change. I think most of the people here on the line will be well informed, right? We are here at the base event. Uh, many of you here uh, will have the ambition to lead 
in, in climate action with your company, uh, most likely also personally to some degree. Uh, most of you uh, might have a look, uh, might have had a look at the recent IPCC report. Um, and um, we all, to some degree, uh, know a little bit the figures from the International Resource Panel, right? So that basically a lot of the emissions that we cause are, are basically due to the, to the materials that we extract and how we use the materials. And um, many resources that we extract from Earth, they move into products. Um, and the industrial emissions are quite significant. And if you look at the manufacturing sector, um, there is a quite a significant share uh, of responsibility. And um, what climate action requires is uh, a, a perspective on the full scope of, the, of, of emissions that you cause, um, not only you know, the direct operations, but also um, upstream and downstream of value chains, uh, the things that you are uh, able to influence. Um, and uh, many companies are doing this now. Um, I think many of you here might also ha have committed to a um, SPTI aligned decarbonization pathway, uh, which is which is an incredible achievement. I always find this like incredible that we that we now moving into a state where ambitious companies in sustainability they they commit to the SPTI logic, which in includes a lot the scope three decarbonization, right? And this is super difficult, um, and this is very very hard but it's the right thing to do. Um, but the, the climate action and the pure carbon lens is not enough. If you look into many of our industries, we have somehow found an operating model, often a linear way of how we, how we um, um, you know, created our industries that is quite inefficient to some degree. Um, if you look at a car, a typical, I think there was a typical French car is, is parked 92% uh, um, of the time. Um, on the bottom left, you see 50%, 50% of inner city land right now is allocated to parking infrastructure uh, and traffic and uh, streets and all of that. So it's quite a significant share of land uh, that is not used very efficiently. On the right-hand side, also just exemplary figures, 87% um, of the plastic waste is either landfilled or incinerated in Europe. And 45% of today's leakage of plastics into the ocean is often from uh, rural areas where the collection infrastructure is not in place. Um, you, many of you, you uh, might have seen these pictures as you see it here on the, on the bottom right, from Indonesia, for example, where many smaller coastal towns don't have the collection infrastructure. Everybody in the plastic, plastic value chain would say, hey, we don't want to see these pictures, of course, and we want to solve it. But to some degree, the system itself, the industry, uh, is working in a way that there is not an incentive to collect collectively address the problem. So the point I want to make here is that um, even if everybody uh, optimizes um, the full scope of emissions, we still have systemic inefficiencies in terms of how we use resources in many of our industries. And lastly, let's also look beyond the carbon funnel. Uh, oftentimes, rightly so, we are looking into the carbon optimizing for climate action, but um, resource use has wider implications on biodiversity, and that's not to forget. I just pulled out this little picture from a report that the WWF um, published last week, um, which emphasized on like mining and mining related deforestation. And it's actually quite significant that uh, mining has a, a, a much larger implication on deforestation than many assume. I think it's the fourth largest driver. And particularly if you take into account indirect effects, um, such as you know infrastructure, um, et cetera, that is quite a significant share. And, and, and what you see on the left here is that almost every industry um, is, is having a, a share of that, uh, of, of that um, effect, I would say. Um, so from a pure resource use perspective, um, we require a more circular economy. Um, the idea behind the circular economy is to optimize for resource productivity. Essentially, the idea to decouple um, the way how we use resources from the resource extraction. So can we find ways of operating our industry that uh, don't rely on, on uh, taking out new material from the earth crust? Um, so from a resource use perspective, the circular economy is a much more productive way of operating an industry system. And we need the circular economy to decarbonize, to dematerialize, and to tackle some of the systemic challenges that I just have shown um, very uh, exemplary only. And this requires a complexity of measures. Um, it requires a complexity of uh, measures on the 
supply side, what you see here on the left hand side, and on the demand side in terms of how we use products. And just a quick snapshot as we don't have too much time, but I want to illustrate a little bit uh, the diversity of measures that is behind the circular economy lens. Um, we're talking about um, supply side related measures such as um, you know, using more sustainable materials, uh, materials that can safely re-enter the environment or can be easily be recycled. We're talking about um, closing material loops, um, such as recycling itself, or also using waste in the system, so waste to energy um, as an example. But what most of the studies on circular economy will tell you is that we cannot recycle our way out of the problem. We will have to change how we use products, which is the right hand side in terms of business models that are able to decouple to some degree the use of a product from the resource resources they consume. So, for example, um, talking about business models that were that benefit from the extended life, such as re-commerce, for example, it's currently an interesting trend in many industries that the secondary market gets quite interesting for many brands. So they go into you know, selling a, a product more often. Um, so monetizing extended product lives, um, also sharing cooling, particularly in mobility. Uh, many studies will show that, that as soon as we are able to share and cool cars, it's a much more effective use of the resource, providing the same kilometers uh, driven, but with much more people. And then uh, leading to our business model and focus here for today, which is uh, the service-based business models. And you see that the blue circle is actually quite all across this, this circular value chain here, because um, as I outlined in the very beginning, with that business model of shifting from product to a service-based um, um, offering, um, suddenly you have incentives as a, as a producer to also optimize many of the other aspects of a circular value chains, so optimizing the design for longevity, for repairability, you, you know that you will get the product back at the end of life. So you start to think around, hey, what happens actually when I get the product back at the end of life, which makes it much easier to close material loops. So to that sense, from a pure circular economy perspective, it's often regarded as the kind of golden business model and a very sustainable business model if it is designed right. Um, there are a lot of examples out there. Um, um, we, have, you know, got, we have Denfoss here on the line. But you know, um, if you look into uh, it is across industries, I find this very interesting that this is really picking up. So we uh, look into machinery and we will see Trump, uh, which is a, a German machinery company producing laser cutting machines, shifting um, at least in, in some customer segments to uh, not selling the machine anymore, but to a pay per part model. Uh, uh, a very established example is Michelin, right? So don't sell tires, um, but think about um, judging based on the on the kilometers traveled. Hilti, which has really moved into a business model of, of running tool fleets as a service. So it's not only about selling the drilling machine, it's about providing customers with the opportunity to, to have access to a fleet uh, that is running. Uh, we have Philips, we have ETAP here also today, um, innovating really in the space of light as a service. And the list goes on and on, and you will see a lot of examples. Um, um, but one thing that I want to emphasize is uh, in this whole space to really unlock the environmental and the, the economic potential, these models need to be designed right. These, uh, these need to be products that, that might under, need to undergo also a design change uh, to work in such operating models. So that's the pure, um, pure um, circular economy perspective from the yellow, uh, uh, from the yellow box you see on the top here. But what I, what I don't want to miss is the opportunity to also take a second perspective here from the, from the pink angle, from the bottom side, looking into this from the perspective of many markets where global market dynamics are, are uh, increasingly challenging. We have seen in the last two or three years, particularly challenges on supply chains. Um, so the, the whole discussion around resilience and transparency is a, is a, is a key priority for many companies. Uh, we see that customers start to adopt to a preference of flexibility. So, um, you know, often not being willing to invest heavily into, into very expensive new assets, but preferring the access to an asset. So what we see in many industries is a, is a slight shift to um, 
also much more servitization uh, happening from a pure customer uh, perspective, um, as this comes with many benefits, particularly as these business models often um, are much deeper and stronger partnerships with the customer. Um, and I want to say, you know, it's not a new idea. Uh, servitization, um, there, there are some founding fathers behind that, right? So Walter Stahl, uh, for example, has, has written the book Performance Economy already centuries ago. Uh, but what has changed over the last 10 to 20 years is that many industries have a new digital backbone. Uh, products are way more connected. Um, and with that digital backbone, a lot of enabling conditions have been built so that I currently see these models emerging much more uh, suddenly, unle uh, although this is not a new idea. Um, due to timing, I cannot go uh, uh, too much into this ecosystem. What we have done in, in a quick analysis is to pull together um, the developments across industries. I will, I'm happy to share that presentation also afterwards with you. Uh, but the key message is essentially, um, you will see movement in the as a service space across industries. This is a space for big organizations, but also for startups. You will see a lot of innovation being also driven by startups, and you will see big companies relying and partnering with young companies to really uh, build that change. Um, I am also working quite a lot with family-owned businesses, for example, in that because they often optimize for the long term. So what you see also in that ecosystem is that if you're in the capital market, oftentimes it's very challenging to build these models. Happy to discuss about that, that further because many of the value unlocks in the mid to the long term. But I think this requires a discussion later in the session today when we talk about also the financial side. Um, one thing which is key, um, as I said before, it's important that you really uh, are able to design these models for impact. And um, in a little study that we have published uh, around two years ago, uh, which is called Everything as a Service, we have started to build a little design guide of going step by step into different elements that are key in order to design you know, circular as a service models. Um, and um, also here, unfortunately, I don't have the time to go much deeper into it, but I want to emphasize the focus of the session today. Uh, what you see here in the blue angle is the whole space of designing the business model and financial model. So even in the business model, right, there are so many different things you can do. You can talk about um, a, a rental model, but also a pooling model, a paper part model. There are so many different fine tunings that you can do to optimize the business model. But one thing that comes more and more central is the whole financial and capital design. So there's a, sh a risk shift happening from the uh, customer to the provider. You take much more risk for your customer. How do you account for that risk? How do you design for that? How do you cover the assets that need to be um, invested? That is, that is a really important design choice to make, and that really requires exchange in events as we have here uh, today. Um, just to close up, um, 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 what we were quite curious uh, is to look into this from really different industries and different products. So we have run uh, a couple of analysis on the product level, looking into mobility, cars, equipment like machinery uh, or white goods like washing machines. And what we always do is we try to analyze this from a decarbonization potential perspective, but also uh, the cost dynamics. So is this model able to deliver um, a more carbon effective um, product essentially? That's one, one, that's the environmental lens. And the second one, is this product able to offer uh, the service of the product in a cheaper way? So out of TCO, cheaper versus a comparable model, because that's an indicator of a profit potential for the producer or um, a, an opportunity to build a competitive advantage. And if you want to go deeper into these products, I would be more than happy to connect. But I want to close with, uh, with just one last thought um, of, saying that um, this is not a new idea, but it's now in a critical timing where I feel it's getting to an inflection point where many things come together, where this is really um, being able to unlock potential on the environmental and economic side, but it will also not happen alone. It will require policy support uh, for some of these business cases, and it will require collaboration. And that's why I think these events like 
here today are super important. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Manuel, for really pointing out the fundamentals of linking the circular economy with servitization, efficiency, design, collaborations. These are all um, very good keywords and indeed all different topics that are worth exploring. So we can talk for hours and hours on these different aspects, but now I will give the floor to uh, Alberto. Uh, and Alberto will share with us a bit uh, how the European Union um, is, uh, is embedded circular economy in its policy to really encourage and support this transition. Uh, thank you very much, Mira. Thank you, all the organization, for, for inviting me to this uh, event. I'm going to try to share the screen. Do you see on bigger, on a bigger size? Yes, it's yes? okay. Okay, per perfect. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, the boring part of uh, the circular economy. It's the, the regulation around the, this, this topic. Uh, and I'm not going to be, I'm not going to focus a lot on the, on the texts of the regulation. Uh, I prefer to be focused on the messages that the European Union uh, is saying about uh, circular economy. Um, as you know, we have in, in Europe uh, three main streams of regulation that uh, has to be adopted by all the member uh, member states. Uh, one is the Green Deal, and then you have the Fit for 55, and also the Repower EU. Um, not all of them are uh, on the same page related with uh, circular economy, but uh, as the European Union has said in several occasions, 40% uh, of the decarbonization and, and to achieve the objectives that we have are related with efficiency aspects. Uh, it includes uh, circular economy and all the things related with the energy that we are consuming uh, in, in our um, industry, in our uh, homes and, and in all the, all the issues of, of our life. The main well, the circular economy is most uh, developed on the Green Deal, but if you read the Fit for 55, that is uh, more focused on energy and or, or obviously the Repower EU, both of them are uh, always talking about the circular economy. It's one of the main streams for the European Union for achieving the objectives that we have. Uh, the last example that we have about this is the Critical Raw Materials uh, Act, uh, you, uh, for sure you know it. Uh, it's, it's not uh, approved yet, but uh, it has one chapter uh, only focused on protecting the environment by improving circularity and sustainability of critical raw materials. This is quite important because, um, as you can see in this uh, act and also with the Repower EU, after the Ukrainian crisis, uh, the Ukrainian war, most of the, well, many people thought that the, the, this crisis uh, was going to affect or, or to have an impact on the objectives that the European Union has for decarbonization. Just because the security of supply, uh, sometimes uh, in, in terms of energy, uh, it's against the, the objectives that we are having for, for decarbonization. But uh, the European Union has answered these issues uh, with the Repower EU, or also with the with this uh, last act that I has uh, I had talked previously, focusing again on the decarbonization. I mean, all the measures that we are going to have in the European Union for the next twenty five years are going to be focused on the same. So we cannot have any doubt that the circular economy is not only something that we need as, uh, as, as people using things in, in our day by day, it's also something that the uh, regulators are quite focused on achieving and to, to get all the objectives that we have uh, related with this. Um, the key concepts for the circular economy in, in the European Union, uh, it's the five uh, issues that we have here, remanufacture, repair, reuse, share, and recycle. Of course, I'm not going to talk about the linear economy model or the circular economy model. Uh, Manuel has explained better than me what the circular economy uh, means and, and what's the impact for the industry. But let me say that the European Union has said that 
all the initiatives to ensure less waste uh, are going to have more value for them. So we can expect, we are seeing it, but we can expect uh, a lot of regulation in, uh, in, the, in the member states very focused on not only to, to permit the circular economy to grow, not only that, also to, I don't like the word, but to punish uh, whoever doesn't use the circular economy on the principle for, for uh, making their businesses or, or the industry, but also to, to let this kind of services, this kind of businesses to grow into uh, in, inside its uh, member states. One of the main reasons of this, uh, if we see the the measures that were planned on the for, about the circular economy on the on the green deal, uh, is the the first one. It's that the European Union is focused on setting minimum requirements to prevent environmental harmful products from being placed on the European market. So let me say that uh, if the industry or or the agents uh, doesn't take into account the circular economy on their processes and on their the way that they not only manufacture things, as Manuel said, also the way that they use the things for this uh, for their own processes, they are going they are going to have uh, some problems with uh, being competitive inside the European Union, and for sure outside the European Union, uh, it's going to be difficult because everybody wants uh, circular economy concepts on the on the products that we are using. But uh, inside the European Union, this is, uh, I mean, this is no doubt about, about this. We have also several measures that you have here, uh, the electronic product passport, uh, legislation in, in its uh, uh, member states, a lot of legislation relating with packaging, uh, with, the, with the, all the digital uh, components and all the, as you see, the, the raw materials, et cetera, et cetera. Um, quite important everything related with batteries and all the things that because we are sure that the mainstream of investment in the European Union for the next let me say 25 years is going to be energy I mean that's something that uh, for sure everybody is agree with that but uh, when we talk about energy it's not only renewables it's not only hydrogen it's not only all the things related with the with the production and the, the the carbonization in terms of CO2. It's also everything that we use in the new electrificated model uh, for for the for the economy that we are focused on. And here the, the batteries and all the raw materials that we need uh, for that electrification is going to be critical. And for sure the circular economy related with this is going to be also uh, quite important. Also uh, there's going to be uh, many many changes on the rules of waste shipments and, of course, illegal exports. So let me say that the European Union wants to be the leader in 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 uh, worldwide of circular economy and efficiency issues, as we know that uh, we probably are very. It's very difficult to be the leader on the uh, energy sector as a country, let me say as, as a union of, of countries, but for sure we can be on, on circular economy. Uh, I'm going to go through the impacts of the plan and the different uh, packages that we have, uh, they have published uh, in the European Union. As you know, in the European Union, we are uh, the best, uh, the best place for, may, for, for creating rules, but that they are very hard to, for reading. The Americans are quite uh, shorter <laughs> when they re uh, write anything related with this, but I'm going to put only the messages related with this. Um, all, the, all the measures that we have to take uh, into account have, has to be aligned with the decarbonization and also with the repower. We know that it's a critical situation uh, with the Ukrainian crisis, not only about energy, but also about raw materials, also about, uh, let me say, security of supply of many things that we are using in, right now in the industry. So uh, uh, the plan related with circular economy has to be aligned with the repower. Uh, they need, we need as, uh, as, um, uh, as a union of countries to reduce <clears throat> the competition for limited resources, uh, 
also we have to be aligned with the fit for 55 and we need to reduce the production costs. This is something also quite important for the European Union. I'm going to show uh, at the end of the presentation the main uh, the main figures that the European Union has uh, planned about uh, circular economy, and it's a quite impact, uh, big impact on the industry related in terms of, of uh, reduction of production costs to, to understand that circular economy has to be in our day by day. And of course, to be cleaner and more competitive in, in terms of, of uh, products. The first package uh, was related with their uh, co-design of regulation for sustainable products. Uh, it has also uh, an strategy related with uh, textiles, and it has a, a, they, they make the proposal for addictive and consumer empowerment in the green transition. This is also, also quite important. Uh, it's the, the empowerment of the customers in everything related with uh, our future. It's not only in energy. I, I also work for, for uh, energy companies, and uh, for the energy companies, one of the main it's that they are going to have for the ne next years is the empowerment of the customers because we were used to be only users of energy and we are going to be let me say another actor uh, in in terms of, of of energy this is also something that the european union wants in the green transition as a concept and of course in the circular economy as one of the points for the for the green transition so the customer has to be uh, is going to have a lot of power related with this. So this is the, the main reason because of uh, uh, the European Union wants the, the customer to be on the center of everything that we are uh, going to, to um, all the policies that they are making. On the second package, uh, there were a, a legislation of uh, packaging and packaging waste, as you know. Also the framework, the new policy framework uh, on bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics, and also a uh, regulation for certification for carbon removals. Uh, there are several uh, developments of these rules, of course, and proposals, uh, and also the, all the state members need to transfer all this uh, regulation to its uh, country. We are not on the same uh, we are not at the same uh, speed in all the countries. Uh, it's different between all the all the places in the European Union. But let me say that most of the um, most of the measures are already has taken on the on the countries. Also, you th have to think that the next GM funds uh, that we have uh, we need to use for the last year, next year, and the, and the and in the next period are also focused on being uh, for the country to, to accomplish all the things related with the new policies that the European Union is uh, proposing, and also in the circular economy. And by the end, the third package was the Green Claims Directive uh, on the subsanation and communication for uh, environmental claims, and also a directive on common rules to promote the, the repair of property, the right to repair. And for ending my presentation, this is the quantitative impact of the economy, uh, circular economy that the European Union has um, estimated. But I think that most of the experts are agree with this, or even uh, with bigger uh, figures uh, that, than the one that uh, I'm showing you. Uh, Thirty percent of of resource efficiency is the target for the for the European Union uh, in terms of two thousand and fourteen for two thousand two thousand and thirty. They are um, well. The energy savings uh, could be between twenty and ninety percent on raw materials, glass, paper, um, everything that we are using right now. Let me say that uh, it's twenty to ninety, but most of the experts uh, assume that it's probably more than 70% in any uh, scenarios. If we accomplish all the things that the uh, European Union is designing for the circular economy, the amounts, uh, the, the, the impact in the, in the um, uh, cost savings for the companies, it's, uh, let me say, huge. Uh, as you see in the in the figures, between 250 and 465, 500, it doesn't matter the, the amount. But one of the 
points here uh, and related with this session is that 50% of this efficiency of this uh, um, savings are going to be on small and medium enterprises. And, and also the, the jobs that we are uh, showing down there, 70, uh, 700, 7,100 jobs in the European Union for this period related with a, a circular economy. But when we talk about the small and medium enterprises, uh, I think it's the place where the XAAS uh, has uh, its, its, um, its, its room, as Manuel said, because not, not all the industry, not all the enterprises are going to be able to have their own circular economy investment or, or uh, infrastructure or whatever. They are, going, they are going to need somebody who gives the service related with this because otherwise they are not going to be competitive in their own industry. And they are going to need to be uh, accomplished with the new rules and the new uh, policies that all the countries and also the cities, this is quite important in circular economy. This, there is not only a regulation on the state members, but also in the municipalities or, or small places. This is going to be quite important for small and medium enterprises. It's 50% uh, or probably most of the new jobs. And they are going to need these issues related, uh, I mean, to be, to be done as a service because they, are, they cannot invest on, on things like this. And I think I'm on time. <laughs> I didn't want to be uh, too much more about this. And thanks to everyone. Please, any questions? Uh, we are mm -hmm. ready for this. Thanks, Mira. Thank you, Alberto, and uh, Manuel as well for your uh, presentations. I think you set the stage very nicely uh, for, for today's event. So we, now we have the first opportunity, as uh, Alberto said, to, to do uh, some uh, questions and answers. So uh, well, while we are receiving some questions, um, I'd like to uh, remind the audience, now we have the time to, to add your questions and maybe uh, some of the uh, questions need to be answered later. So having stated that, let's see what is coming in. Um, so I'm seeing that uh, Parikshit Naik, I hope I pronounced it correctly, is, has a question for uh, Manuel. And uh, so uh, Parikshit is asking uh, that one of the biggest challenges for manufacturers when adopting as a service can be the financial performance related to the linear model of producing products and to sell them. Sales teams are currently incentivized to sell products and um, considering or considering what, if we would not change the way financial performance is measured, uh, it, it can be difficult to implement it. And so how would, uh, uh, how, do you, how do businesses that you have worked with, Manuel, uh, have worked with this issue related to measuring performance? That's a super good question. And it's spot on, I think, um, because it shows a little bit how difficult this is in reality for many organizations. Um, because it's 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 a, it's a question of like how you like you know what kind of metrics you optimize for in a normal operating mode, but it's also an organizational element. So if if we're talking about sales and as a service, suddenly it's not about like um, pure sales hubs anymore. You might need a service component and everything around that and huge implications and also um, the uh, the internal performance management systems are in sales are often structured in a way that are completely on, on volume so that's a that's also my observation a, a quite critical point um, <clears throat> two reflections on that one is um, I see that uh, companies who are able to build such models successfully often look at this with the, with a mid to long term horizon so it's um, you know, as a service models are, are quite revolutionary and you will not build this from today to tomorrow. Uh, and I see a strategic lens to this as the key to say like, look, um, it doesn't mean that this like will completely replace your current business model um, within one to two years, but maybe that's first a specific growth segment, a specific customer group uh, that will adopt it. And for you, that's one strategy to um, essentially win in that customer segment. And it might happen that if these models get successful, um, it can turn around and it will be mid to long term an important growth segment. So I think it's it's more a strategic discussion, less a competitive discussion versus the core business. Um, but this requires 
strong leadership support. Um, sometimes not only the kind of senior executive, but also even like the, the shareholders, uh, because oftentimes shareholders put those performance incentives, um, uh, which are more short-term oriented onto the company. So you see, for example, family-owned businesses uh, pioneering many of these as a service models because they look into generational capability of the company. Like, will my kids be able to run a company? And when you get in this thinking, suddenly you, you, you challenge a little bit harder on some of the current business models. That is one thing. And to your specific question on the KPIs, it's quite interesting um, because it goes also a little bit into the direction of like, how do you measure the circular economy? And that's the hottest topic uh, for most companies as they need to find ways in, in measuring the economic and environmental performance. Uh, one idea to your question is to introduce a, a figure of measuring the share of circular sales. So, um, and uh, I think I've read that for BASF recently, the chemical company, they have introduced um, a way of um, a kind of categorizing their products into circular and non-circular products, and they try to, to bring up the sales share of the circular products um, and as a KPI, which they can optimize for. Thank you, uh, Manuel. I think that was a very, uh, uh, yeah, very, very relevant question indeed that was raised and a very uh, interesting answer. And also thank you for the, for the reading uh, recommendation to look into that further. Uh, there is one more question uh, raised to uh, Alberto, and I can also relate to it from my experience working in the AS project. Sometimes when we talk about efficiency uh, clients, uh, that might be uh, manufacturers that, that could potentially uh, buy or require as a service propositions, are not only thinking about the, the electricity efficiency, but also mentioned the water efficiency in their, in their industry. And I see yeah, from the audience, one question, referring to a specific slide of uh, um, that, that indicated uh, relating to the to the water savings that the EU wishes to uh, realize could you could you elaborate on um, on the question raised by Javier Rey? yeah okay uh, thanks for the for the question Javier well let me say that uh, water is uh, is quite critical not only in in terms of uh, circular economy but in terms of, of uh, the um, to, to be able to manage the needed of, of water that we are going to have in, in the next years, the next period. Uh, there's a rule uh, 202741, I think, from the European Parliament. It's, the 20, it's, it's uh, I think it's March of 2020, uh, where they uh, establish which are the, the measures that the state, member states needs to take uh, related with the reuse of water. As you can imagine, it's, uh, it differentiates uh, the use of water in, in at uh, households and also in this industry and also for, for, the, for the agriculture. Uh, the point is, uh, when we talk about water, is the same uh, than than when we talk about energy. Uh, it's quite difficult to make rules for all the countries because the situation of water is different in each country. Uh, when we talk about energy, it's not the same to talk about the energy mix in Spain or France or Germany or whatever. So uh, you are not going to find uh, uh, too strict, let me say, rules from the European Union to the state members about the use of water. It's, it's much more a guidance of which are the penalties, where, what are the things that you don't, you cannot let the industry to do with, the, with water or the households or whatever, and many recommendations about rules that has to be developed in the, in the, mem in the state members. Uh, and also, let me say that this is from 2020, let me say that there's a, a discussion in, in, inside the European Union uh, about the hydrogen technology, because hydrogen technology, it's uh, the future, or many many people think it's the future on, on energy, on, and also in, in, the industrial, uh, um, in the industrial processes. But the problem is that it needs water. Uh, so it's going to be difficult to, to make, let me say, to align uh, the the needs that we have of reutilization of of water with the needs related with with energy. 
Thank you, Alberto, for and, and Manuel as well for uh, your presentations again and for your question, uh, for your answers, answers, I should say. So it's now time to move to the next session. And after that session, there will be a panel discussion and another Q&A moment. So maybe some of the questions can be answered then and if otherwise later by email. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Next up are first Jonas Hildebrand of Danfoss and, and uh, subsequently Dominique Planke of uh, ETAP. Since they already have been introduced, I will now uh, give the screen to, uh, to Jonas and much looking forward to his presentation. Thanks a lot, Arno. And please let me know if that works and you see a nice uh, picture of a city with some green trees. Yes, works perfect. very good. Good. Uh, hello also from my side. Um, and thanks, uh, Manuel and Alberto, for the uh, inspiring uh, presentations that I'd like to complement now with a view of Danfoss uh, on circularity and, and service business models. I will do two things. Uh, one is uh, introduce Danfoss to give a bit of context and introduce circularity at Danfoss. And then secondly, go, to, go into our example of uh, refrigeration as a service, the business model that we have built in Danfoss. First of all, who, who is Danfoss um, and what is important to know about Danfoss? Um, Danfoss is a multinational uh, Danish-based um, technology company. And I think the one, one uh, term to describe it, it's an energy efficiency company. So we design and sell, manufacture and sell components in, in different, for different industries that increase the energy efficiency of these sectors, be it buildings, be it industrial, or be it also transport. Um, and building on uh, what Manuel has said, um, that sometimes uh, those companies with a longer term view um, uh, are, are front runners or uh, well, are maybe likely to be front runners in servitization models. Danfoss is a family slash foundation owned company. So uh, uh, yeah, also has one of these, uh, oh, has the long term view as one of the priorities. So uh, by, by now uh, grown quite big, but that is not the case, that that's not the topic of today, but the topic is uh, what do we do with regard to uh, circularity? And uh, to, to enter into that, um, Danfoss has uh, set itself a very ambitious uh, ESG um, agenda uh, until 2030 uh, with basically three pillars. One is enabling customer decarbonization with our customers. Secondly, and that's the main topic of today, <clears throat> then is innovating with best in class circular products. And then thirdly, um, last but not least, uh, uh, diversity inclusion, um, making a step change on that is, is part of the ESG agenda of Danfoss. And, and Danfoss uh, really is, uh, I have to say that is going all in on circularity and decarbonization. If we go into the middle column here to give a bit of, uh, yeah, say uh, a couple of examples of what, what do we do in order to get to a circular economy. And that is very much building also on, uh, Manuel, what you have, what you have given as, as examples along the, say, product life cycle that we see on the left. Um, um, what are the activities in order to get to circularity? One is uh, definitely, and that's, uh, that's actually a very big part, is designing and developing our products in a circular way. So having that as, as a design principle, basically, which then also includes alternative materials, recycled materials, or uh, recyclable uh, materials. Second step is then when we look into the life cycle of the products and the, during operations, um, design the products even more for longer last, for long, lasting longer. Right? So really taking that into account, taking the usage into account um, when designing the project, uh, products. And then the third one, if we go uh, further in the, in the wheel of the uh, product life cycle, also take into account already at the design of the product, um, what happens after its first use. Can we repair them? Can we refurbish them? Do they need to be easy to disassemble in order to uh, give them a second life? That's the product focused part of circularity at Danfoss. But then how do we do that? Um, and how do we complement that? The way that Danfoss has chosen is that what we see on the bottom right, um, we select partners at the beginning, viewers of course, but then by 2030, it's gonna be the majority of our partners that we work together in establishing uh, 
basically business models um, that are circular in its in its nature. One is, uh, for example, refrigeration as a service that I go to in, into in a second. But then there's also uh, um, ideas and uh, projects ongoing, like product take back systems, where we as Danfoss, who are mainly providing components, sometimes systems uh, for our customers, we have to work with our customers, wholesalers, OEMs that in the end bring the bring the products uh, to our to the end users. So product take back system is, is an example, or another one would be working on reusable returnable packaging to, to harvest the maybe a bit lower hanging fruits uh, than having fully circular product designs. Let's go into refrigeration as a service. What do we mean by that? And uh, why do we do this at Danfoss? So refrigeration as a service in Danfoss refers to an all-in-one a service solution that we offer to our supermarket customers. So what Danfoss has done traditionally already for, for decades is providing best-in-class components and control systems for refrigeration systems in supermarkets. Now, what we see um, in order to, to go one step further and uh, both take into account, uh, say, the circularity um, view, but even more, and that was actually our starting point, I, I really wanna emphasize that, um, our starting point has, has been the situation of our customers. What do we see in the supermarket refrigeration space? We see that they, the, our customers are uh, facing a lot of challenges. There is a technological transition, uh, transformation ongoing to using natural refrigerants, which comes with uh, increased complexity. And it's a, it's a more co complicated technology. We're not all our, all of our customers are ready to go down that road on their own. Secondly, um, managing refrigeration systems for a food retailer, for a supermarket chain, involves a lot of coordination work with multiple service providers, inter interfaces they need to manage. Not for everyone. This is actually how they would like to spend their work time. Thirdly, um, as for many other companies, um, for our food retail uh, customers, sometimes it's also difficult to really take into account end-to-end -end or total cost of ownership perspectives when they do investments. So there might be different uh, incentives in, the in different functions at the customer who are basically uh, competing uh, on different uh, KPIs, what they want to achieve. And then fourthly, um, and that's related to the first one, um, our customers, not all of them have the capabilities and the capacities to really build up technological expertise to run the systems that they have in their stores on their own. So what is our solution? Our solution is that we say uh, refrigeration as a service is, is an offering that complements, and again, building on what Manuel said, it's complementing, it's not replacing uh, our offering uh, of Danfoss, but it's complementing uh, our offering, which has so far been hardware and some services with an offering that is a hassle-free all-in-one solution. Customer gets project design, project management, equipment, including the financing, all the services relating to running refrigeration systems in supermarkets over seven, 10, 15 years, and all maintenance and, and spare parts. And if they like the energy in one, product, one service, one solution at a fixed monthly fee. Um, if, if we take one step back and say, okay, but if, what does that actually mean? What, what, what elements are, are part of the solution? Um, then for us at Danfoss, uh, we have said, this is, it's, it's actually um, a handful of, um, handful of principles when we think about as X as a service models. One thing, it's bundling products and services and transferring the investments from a customer side to operational expenses. Secondly, we as a provider take responsibility, again, relating to the risk, shifting the risks from the end user to the provider along the value chain, along the life cycle. Thirdly, um, Danfoss, as, as I indicated, we have uh, for decades been uh, developing components and also control systems um, for supermarket refrigeration systems. We use that backbone and enable an as-a-service solution with this digital backbone. And then lastly, 
but certainly not to underestimate um, the provider. So in this case, Danfoss with its partners uh, acts as a single point of contact for the customer. So no more need to coordinate between all the different uh, partners that you see on the uh, bottom left for the end user for our customers, be it hardware slash equipment providers, be it financing partners, be it service providers, be it maintenance companies, or also utilities or energy companies that provide you with the energy that you need. So this is for us um, the scope of our X as a service refrigeration as a service offering. And uh, if you see now these, these uh, additional light gray elements, you see that this is actually, it's, it's quite a lot of boxes to coordinate and to include into one offering. How uh, is, is Danfoss doing this and, and uh, yeah, approaching this? Um, as, as indicated by some of the questions already, um, Danfoss is also a more, or, yeah, you could say traditional components manufacturing company. And for us, the shift to uh, as a service model is a big one. So um, we would need to build new capabilities, new capacities in order to not only sell and manufacture and sell products, but also uh, support them and uh, give an offering for over, over the life cycle of the, uh, of the products. So what we have done is partnered with a, a project management and, and service operations company called Aneo, who is complementing the Danfoss elements with its strengths of really running systems in a most efficient way based on the digital platform that Danfoss is providing. So for us, um, that's maybe also one, one uh, yeah, basically reply to those, how can you do it? Of course, we can build everything on our own, right? Uh, but uh, I think... ...in the market. Good. Um, let's use the last minutes um, to, uh, yeah, to share basically some learnings and then also some opportunities that we see um, at Danfoss and start with the learnings. First one definitely is new. this new business model is new and new means different and different means difficult. Uh, difficult for everyone to really uh, embrace that change. And everyone means both internally and that includes, for example, um, sales. So we need to really ensure how, how do we sell these services? Um, how, do we, how do we then also operate them? How do we book them even in our, in our systems? But it's also as big of a change for our customers that might be familiar already with as a service models in their private life of having phone as a service, car, other mobility services or, or solar rooftop PV. Um, but really making that change and realizing and taking a strategic decision is refrigeration and technical equipment, in our case for supermarkets, is that at our core? Can I do this best? Or is it something for, for experts to take care of? Is a big shift, so it takes time, it takes a lot of uh, education, it takes a lot of communication to get this model uh, running. Secondly, um, that then also expands our uh, stakeholder set. If we think about it from Danfoss side, um, it's not only the technical uh, departments at our customers, it's not only the purchasing departments that we uh, deal with, but it's, uh, it's going up to the CFO, right? Because it is, it, it, these models have a high financial uh, element basically and, and shift of the financial um, management of the company. So we really need to also expand the stakeholders that we address with our, with our solution as a provider. Thirdly, um, I think that's also something that both Alberto and Manuel mentioned. Um, you saw all these different small elements, but it's not only the elements and adding them up, but it's really combining them in the smartest way. And that's why we, I, I, I phrase it the way that I say, the ecosystem unlocks the value. It's not only the elements of it um, that, that we put together. And then to close the loop to circularity as, as the last um, um, learning and also offer more even opportunity for, for the future, we see as a service models uh, as circularity enabler, which means um, that we still have a lot of uh, elements that we can include into this model that we have, uh, uh, that we have not fully embraced yet. One is uh, really using this model also to experiment with product reuse, remanufacturing, using also uh, returned products, which is much easier if we have the responsibility, if we take care of the operations, 
than it is going out to customers and con convincing them taking uh, reused products into their into their equipment. Secondly, uh, we can also, um, as a provider of uh, very important um, components of the solutions like compressors, uh, frequency converters, we as Danfoss, who know the components best, can best then also um, uh, yeah, use, uh, initiate measures to, to extend the lifetime of our equipment. Thirdly, um, we can, even more than today, bundle our offering with green energy. And that not only means it's green, green labeled um, energy, but combining, combining our offering with own production of electricity, be it solar PV or other measures, um, that, that's another yeah, element that we, that we want to add into our offering to make it even more circular. And then actually the one that I, that I added live after hearing the conversations is actually how can we start labeling and also marketing and then communicating this product, this solution, as even uh, as, as, as a circular one, because we know it does enable circularity, but how do we measure that, right? And that, that's also one thing, as, as Emmanuel was saying, it's one of the hot topics, and we're also active in, in figuring that out and making it even stronger um, to not only say it's, it makes sense, but it's also uh, from a from business perspective, but it also makes sense from a circularity perspective. That's uh, refrigeration as a service at Danfoss. Um, the last statement that I wanna make is that Although we see all these green backgrounds and circularity, uh, social governance, environmental governance, and uh, uh, decarbonization, for for Danfoss actually the starting point has not only been being good and being uh, decarbonized, but it's really good business both for our customers and for us. So it's again it's about efficiently operating systems, and energy efficiency is a good business for everyone. Thanks a lot um, for your, your attention on, on, uh, on, on this short presentation. I am very much looking forward to uh, now, of course, first of all, hear from, from uh, our colleague from uh, ETAP, um, and then afterwards continue the discussion. So Dominique, I think over to you. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, I can't share yet, Jonas, while you're sharing. I have to stop then, you mean? I assume <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. Okay, I hope uh, you all hear me loud and clear. Thank you all uh, for participating to the webinar. Very, um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be uh, with you also today. Um, I'm going to share a little bit of, um, after a short introduction of who we are um, at ATAP, uh, explain how for us actually circular economy is at the heart of everything that we are doing. Uh, and what we are then doing concretely uh, with what we call circular uh, light as a service. Okay, so uh, who are we? We are a family owned company. It was already mentioned several times that um, uh, family owned companies have an, uh, a longer term approach to things. So uh, it was the same with ATAP. Um, we already more than 70 years in the business, but always had let's say sustainable development um, in the DNA of, uh, of the company and everything that we are doing. Uh, we are much smaller than Danfoss, eh? um, but um, nevertheless, we think that we can be a player in this field toward the circular economy and at least want to be setting the pace in the lighting industry towards that. Now, what we are doing, Already for years, we have been contributing to a more comfortable and safe working environment in all kinds of different applications, as you see here. And we do that by offering a complete set of uh, solutions. So it are products and uh, uh, systems and services directed towards 
um, general lighting applications, think about your office, but also emergency uh, lighting applications. How did we come to reflect on um, circularity? Well, actually, when in 2020 uh, we did our strategic update, uh, we revisited our purpose. We did that on a comprehensive analysis of all kinds of different trends that were there in the market, but two out of them really were close to you know, who we are as a company, but also where we saw that we could really uh, contribute towards. And it, they already have been mentioned today. It is about that challenge to become carbon neutral as a, as a continent, whilst not wasting a lot of resources when we are doing that. So we incorporated that into our purpose. You know, we think we can, even being a small company, contribute to society at large by basically offering sustainable lighting uh, con uh, solutions that are customized around the needs of our uh, customers. And, and while doing that, also contributing to protecting um, the planet. Now, for us, when it's in our purpose, it's not... Um, a greenwashing exercise. So you will see that reflected back also in the credo that we have developed and that we have shared with all our employees, where it's not for nothing that we have put emphasis on the renovation market, because we are strongly believing that if the construction industry, which has 38% of all carbon emissions in uh, Europe, needs to go carbon neutral, then it will not happen via the new builds. It will happen via renovation. So we said, what can we do to emphasize and focus on that renovation market? We also strongly believe that lighting as a service is not only a solution that offers peace of mind towards the end users, we also see that as an absolutely to be done um, way of running the business if we want to accelerate the adoption of circular lighting solutions. And I will come back on that point later. But we also know that we will not do it on our own. Uh, we need to partner up. So also partnering is at the center of that uh, credo. And last but not least, we also need to do our own thing. Eh? Uh, it already has been uh, put forward by other speakers, uh, but yes, also ATAP is on that path uh, to deliver on its uh, um, science-based target initiative objectives, which as we all know is a minus 50% by 2050. Happy to say that at the end of last year, we were at minus 42 versus our baseline of 2018. So, so we feel that we are there on uh, the right um, path. Towards the market, uh, we are communicating this uh, approach, this embracing of circular uh, lighting under the theme of tomorrow's light. Uh, there's a little bit of a game in wording around that. Of course, it is what we could call innovative lighting. We like to surprise our customers on a continuous basis, but it should also be light in a sense that the lighting has a light impact uh, from a carbon footprint um, perspective. And the way we put this really into practice is by, first of all, focusing on the use stage. Eh? What can we do as a company to actually make the ideal product from a circular lighting perspective? That's, of course, making it last as long as it can. But of course, that not always always works. So what, what, what can we then do? And of course, then it's all about making the repairing effortless, but also zooming in and trying to find solutions to actually refurbish the lighting, which is out there in the market, uh, because then we can do that on site at our customers. That's more um, environmental friendly than having to take the products back to our uh, manufacturing facility and then to remanufacture. And I think it was Manuel who said that, you know, recycling should be absolutely the last thing we should be focusing upon from a circular perspective. And that's true. And, and, and of course, we also do there our thing and, and, and we contribute there. We'll show you at the end of the presentation a little bit more about that, but that's truly the last thing. Now, 
if you're more interested in knowing a little bit more about the way we are approaching it, you have a white paper that you can find on, um, on our website, which is actually forming the uh, guidance for our product development department when they are making new products. Understanding that for all companies, also for ATAP, it's a journey. It's not like we are there. Um, I think we did already quite some steps forward, but we have still a long way to do. For example, we are measuring also the percentage of circular products uh, from our total sales that we are uh, achieving. And there we see that we still have a long way to go. Um, but we have been looking at the different stages in which that we could apply circularity, zooming in, of course, on design. Now, our products are already very efficient. You know, we typically, when we offer a solution to our customer and we are renovating from an existing uh, fluo-based lighting solution, we would offer them 60 to 80% energy efficiency. But how can we stretch that even further? It is all starting by the design. We know that basically when you look at the building, 70% of the impact it has on its carbon footprint is going to come after commissioning the building. But 80% of those of that impact is already being defined at the design stage. So really thinking what can we do to make products that are outperforming from a design perspective is that the very first thing that we are doing. In lighting terms, people think that, you know, LED lighting lasts forever, which technically is true, but then you don't get any light anymore out of it. And that's what they call the lumen depreciation. We have mastered that in a way that actually our latest innovation that we have been bringing to the market only loses 1% of the lumen output after 50,000 hours. That means actually that the design that you can have for your lighting requires less luminaires at the outset because you will not lose on depreciation along the lifetime of the product. But there are also other ways. That's basically by maximizing the beam uh, of the light that comes out of the luminaires. And there also we brought a new product family to the market that is actually allowing to lit the same space with more than 50% or less than 50%, I should say, luminaires in the original lighting uh, design. So there, by having the same performance and impact, but do that with less material. And when it's about maintenance, a nice example I always like to show is when we talk about industrial lighting, where uh, products, which are what they call high bay products, because they are really hanging out there at 15 to 20 meters height, they would typically be designed as a seal for life type of product because difficult to maintain. Our latest solution there is actually allowing for ease of maintenance while achieving still a high degree of IP. So that is being protected for dust and water um, uh, ingrains. So uh, again, when you think about circularity, you will design your products absolutely in another way. Uh, a, a small little side remark, this product has a form factor, which is actually avoiding that there's a lot of dirt and, and dust accumulating, which means that they need to be rinsed less often than other products that would be used for that purpose in um, industries like the food industry, where they hate uh, uh, dust being falling down into their production um, uh, machinery. Um, so actually, making the link to another speaker who was mentioning uh, using less water, well, actually, that would be a nice side effect of this product as well. But then we really challenged ourselves when it came to renovation. You know, do we always need to sell a full product or can we actually refurbish on-site um, the lighting uh, systems of our, uh, of our customers, or for that matter, customers of competitive products? And I will show you a very short um, video that illustrates this uh, in one minute. Our world is changing fast. 
we face global climate change and depletion of natural sources. We must act today for a better tomorrow. It's time to upgrade your lighting. It's time for tomorrow's light. Reduce your energy consumption, lower your environmental impact, and be prepared for the upcoming phasing out of fluorescent lamps. Our refurbishment solutions allow to upgrade your existing luminaire to LED in an easy, quick, and circular way. Improve comfort and lower consumption. Tomorrow's light is endless, effortless, wasteless. ETAP. Tomorrow's light. So actually, we applied that um, in uh, at a customer here in Belgium, uh, Telenet called, uh, and like you saw it, it was capable of doing the renovation while people were continuously working. So thinking in a more circular way actually is offering additional benefits that that you would maybe think. And of course, we also need to think about using recycled materials uh, or even biomaterial like the few examples that I'm showing uh, here. Now we are offering this as a complete light as a service, not only because we are convinced that the, let's say lighting solutions of tomorrow, the LED based lighting solutions connected to the systems and more and more use of sensors becomes a, um, yeah, a hurdle and, and, and uh, an issue for our customers to maintain. Uh, we also are convinced that only by keeping ownership of products, manufacturers can really stimulate a circular economy. If the manufacturer is not responsible for his or her product, then we are convinced that circular economy is not going to take off. And actually, it is a very good business case for the customers because with the energy savings, as well as the cuts on maintenance costs, you can actually achieve monthly fees that are lower than the operating expenses the company anyhow has. In the end, we talk about, of course, offering our customers um, the final options. So what, so what do they want to do after uh, the contract period? And that can be a contract extension with a maintenance contract can be, like already said, refurbishment on site, can also be returning for reuse or if really required recycling to uh, ATAP itself. But if the, comp the customer says, you know, I just want to take over the lighting installation because it still works for me in a perfect manner, then they can also do that with or without a maintenance contract. So there we basically have the approach of, we offer different optionalities to our customers and it's up to them to choose what they want. Okay, I'm open uh, with the other uh, presenters now, I think, for all the questions. Many thanks, Dominique and Jonas, for those um, two very excellent uh, presentations. We're running a little bit behind schedule, um, so I propose the following. I'll ask Two or three questions to you, Jonas and Dominic. There are similar questions and you can answer those from your perspective. And then I can hand over to Arnaud for a few questions if time's allowed from, uh, from the audience before uh, wrapping up. So my two questions to both of you and um, Jonas, you can start and then Dominic, you can, you can follow up. Is what are or have been the key challenges that you're facing or have faced in making the transition happen in your organization and connected to that, how is and has your organization benefited from this transition and why do you think it's happening now? Because of course, this business model is not new that has existed and has been mentioned since the seventies. So why is this transition really accelerating now? Uh, many thanks. Thank, thanks, Dimitris. Um, and let me 
um, get back to a couple of points that were mentioned, I think, throughout the different four different uh, presentations. So I think the, the main, the, the biggest challenge for Danfoss has been making that shift in a business model, which requires also business processes and thinking how we how we sell, how we uh, offer our, our solutions, having in mind that Danfoss is a highly successful component design, manufacture and sell company, right? So there's a, there's a super strong culture of efficient operations and operators efficiently selling products. Um, and as, as everyone has said, such a point, some, some capabilities that we need to build in order to go into surfaceization models, this has internally basically been the main challenge um, to build that. Um, I would even dare to say uh, bigger than bringing the customers on board. Um, and then secondly, uh, how uh, the, the second part of the question was, how uh, has Danfoss benefit so, so far, right? And, and maybe also uh, um, yeah, jumping on, on the train that has, has left the station a couple of years ago uh, on, on decarbonization. So um, Danfoss has actually, uh, I think for Danfoss, there's, there's two main benefits. One is, uh, is of, of course, it's enabling circular decarbonized business models. Right, everything that Manuel has started, Alberto has continued, and then both Dominique and myself have, all has, have also said, it is an enabler for, for circular business models, or it's a circular business model in itself. That's, that's one um, pro, but then actually for Danfoss itself, uh, the, the other big um, uh, advantage that we have is that, that we actually have to walk the talk, right? We cannot only say anymore, we have the best products and um, convince our customers that they are the best and they are the most efficient and, and so on but we really need to work with our products and we have learned so much being responsible for running our, our products in the field, in, in whatever harsh environment there is out there, right? That you cannot, um, and that, that experience you cannot get from the labs, you cannot get from customer visits, from customer interviews, from customer immersion. You only get it when you really operate the equipment yourself. And it has given us lots of great feedback already for, for improving our offering. Many thanks, Jonas. Uh, Dominique, from your side. Yeah, maybe. I, I think um, there's not one area in the company that has not been touched. Eh? So it's in the way you sell, already has been sell, said uh, also by Jonas, you know, selling services is something completely different than selling products. Uh, it's the way in which yet you develop products. So we developed uh, our own um, circularity index uh, as, a, as a development guideline as well towards our development department. But they also need to think more in developing platforms. They need to think in developing using open standards, um, which is also quite um, a, a shift. Uh, it's also for manufacturing, you know, um, being more into the customized uh, refurbishment is, is, an, is another way of, uh, of producing than if you just uh, pour out standard products from your, um, from your manufacturing facilities. Um, and it also touches, of course, things like um, our FNA department, which has to take all the risks linked to selling uh, uh, those contracts into account, uh, teaming up with banks and other partners to make it all happen. So every individual uh, uh, part of the organization has been touched and that's why we really put it at the center of our purpose and it really, really reflected in, into our uh, credo. The advantages, yes, it absolutely makes business sense if you develop your products for that purpose. Eh? So um, of course our products um, are, need to be of the highest quality and of course they are from a product only perspective, more expensive. But if you look at the total cost of ownership of, of products, they are absolutely cheap. Eh? So it's more about the way you present it, the way you engage, um, the way, for example, um, governments are doing their public tendering. Eh? If they take total cost of ownership, full impact of circular cost into consideration, uh, you will have more success than with customers who are just say, well, thank you, but I don't care. I just want a cheap product and I throw it away after a few years. Um, so, so yeah, so it's, it's fit for um, uh, manufacturers who are selling quality, I would say it in that way. Many thanks, Dominique and Jonas. I think we, we're running a little bit out of time, but I have a few questions that I could share to the, to the panel afterwards. 
um, and we could see how we could provide this, this information to the audience. But maybe I hand it over to Arnaud. Uh, maybe if time allows for one question from the audience, otherwise some closing uh, remarks. So uh, yeah, think, thanks to the audience for all the, for the many questions. Uh, I think uh, there's maybe, well, let, let's see if this is uh, not a deep topic to, to dive into considering uh, uh, the time on the clock. Uh, one question is relating to the, to the accounting systems uh, or the accounting challenges related to implementing uh, as a service. And, um, and, and yeah, the question is uh, for, for Danfoss, for Jonas. Um, relating to the ownership of the asset and combining that with appropriate uh, accounting systems. Is, was that a challenge for Danfoss uh, because you have implemented the model? Uh, was that a big issue? Uh, how did, how did Jonas, uh, sorry, Danfoss go tackle that? Um, not, not sure I get all, all the details of the question, but of course the accounting uh, part is, is important um, and, and we have uh, done quite some investigation how we can how we can best solve that and be compliant with all the guidelines and uh, rules that are in place. Actually, in, uh, one thing that we have done is uh, uh, offering this via a separate company, which makes it a bit easier than uh, within the larger Danfoss context. But that's one technicality, and there might be 10 others that uh, the colleague might be interested in. So happy to discuss further later. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, yeah, I, I think I have to hand it over to, to Mira. And um... Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Arnaud. I think it's it's time for us to to close the the webinar. So I would like to address a very big thank you to all of our speakers. It was it was really a very interested web webinar, and as I said, there's we can discuss for hours and hours. A very short concluding remarks. So circular economy is really a transversal matter. Uh, and essential to many elements that are essential to our uh, sustainable economy. We've made the link between um, circular economy and uh, our environmental impact, between circular economy and the efficiency of our industrial systems. We've also made the link between circular economy and the transition to a, a carbon neutral economy, not only from a resource efficiency perspective, but also uh, in order to ensure the, uh, the secure of uh, supply of critical materials to this green transition. Um, circular economy and servitization implies a lot of changes, uh, changes within the ecosystem of companies, the relationship, new partnerships, uh, but also changes within the company. So as Dominique Planck um, mentioned that every department within the organization had to adapt to, to these uh, circular economy transition. Uh, a lot of challenges, but luckily also these challenges are compensated by a lot of opportunities, environmental opportunities, sustainable opportunities, but also business opportunities. Um, before we leave, I would just like to invite you also to look at our uh, upcoming webinar. We have a, a session that is organized on the 16th of May, where we will dive into more the financial aspect of um, uh, financing circular business model. Alberto mentions the fact that the European Commission uh, committed to unlock billions of euros of investments in order to ensure the transition to a circular economy. Uh, but uh, financing circular business model remains quite a challenge. We saw that there's a lot of changes and transformation that are required, and the financing sector is perhaps not uh, uh, completely used to these uh, new business models um, because of the fact that they are focused currently a lot on, on the linear uh, business models. And so here in this upcoming webinar, we will look at the challenges, but also the opportunities from the financing uh, sector perspective with regards to supporting these business model and also what can be the way forward and some practical cases and examples. So thank you very much again. You've got the link to our Efficiency as a Service website where you can see our upcoming initiative. You have also all of our contact details. So please feel free to reach out to us and we will circulate a Q&A uh, paper of the webinar with all the, the questions that we haven't had the chance to address uh, during the call. So thank you very, very much. And uh, we talk soon. And on the 16th of May is our next event. Thank you. Many thanks, everyone. Thanks to everyone.
Thanks, everyone. Bye.